basis in fact. And, and and you know, it kind of was every week. I would turn on the morning radio and hear all this madness and look at the evening news and it was more madness. And 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 we all know about the, the awful situations of racism that, you know, I don't want to, it, it hurts my soul, I can't get into everything, but we all know what they are. You just have to look at the news. The, Awful anti-Semitism is at an all-time high. I mean, so I came to Deb, and through these conversations, we decided to me being an art dealer, Deb being an incredible artist, to do what we do best. We can affect or try to spark a conversation, an alliance, a, 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 a further dialogue some good deliberate deeds by this exhibit. Deb's art, as you can see all around us, speaks to uh, a community, it speaks to alliance, it speaks to relationships. That is what this all is. So this is our way, if you will, of, of, of addressing that and reminding people, reminding all of you and anyone else that the fact of the matter is, in the 60s, probably even beyond that, blacks and Jews were very aligned in the civil rights march. We, we were, we, we, blacks and Jews died down south. Those students that were murdered for civil rights, we were aligned, and that's the fact. So anyone that tells you differently about what, how they feel today, you remind them after this, that the fact around the time of MLK and the Freedom Summers and those students, that's what happened between blacks and Jews. So uh, 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 I love thoughts and prayers. I think that they're very important. But I constantly hear thoughts and prayers. Our thoughts and prayers are for you. Our thoughts and prayers. And Deb and I talked about that. And we wanted to do something more. We wanted to be able to you know, and then we talked with Josh, we talked with uh, uh, Marie, uh, uh, Maria, and we decided together to be able to do something more. And, and again, this, this, is, this is that. There's, there's just too much hate. There's just so much hate, so much uh, divisiveness, so much. And, uh, you know, again, not being a dead horse, this is our way to do that. So, Art to us is the catalyst. Hopefully when you look around, everything is for sale. I am an art dealer. Right? We, we need to keep the lights on. So please talk to me. Okay? You know, you'll see a QR code. You can hit it. You can look at the art, please. Uh, but, uh, you know, it is a, a, a real uh, time for us to express ourselves in this way. And, and, and especially Debbie. Uh, there is a reception. I thank you all for coming. This is dinner time. I couldn't, you know, not have you come here without feeding you. So literally across the street after this is a place called the, the White Bowl. And there's, a, there's plenty of food. So please, if you get a moment, go come across the street. Some more fellowship. It's an open bar for a little bit, you know, and come across and uh, enjoy yourself. But uh, I'm going to introduce Deb now. It's going to... Thanks, Carl. Thank you for coming up with the idea for doing this exhibit and the Forgotten Alliances. Your vision, support, and guidance since we were kids has always been invaluable. You have been through it all with me. We have a strong alliance. Imagine this. Snapshot one. A small girl with blonde pigtails arrives back to New York City from the Navajo Reservation, where she has lived for two years to the warm embrace of her grandparents. Five years old, the Shabbat table is set with a white linen tablecloth and Sephardic delicacies of lamb, fasulia, and Spanish rice laid in the center. The Sabbath candles are lit and Poppy sings a prayer over the wine. The warmth of family and the Sabbath meal envelops me. Snapshot two, Poppy pulls out a cigarette from the package. I watch him light the white stick the orange flame glowing 
and he starts to share memories of his time in Dachau and Buchenwald concentration camps. He talks openly about the firing squads, the Nazis, and the horrors that he witnessed and experienced. These are my earliest memories. I live with the love of my Judaism entwined with an even deeper fear of being Jewish. I live my life in dualities. I have always used my art as a way to attempt to capture the things I cannot comprehend and to stay sane in a world that is overwhelming at times. The painting Shabbat Ghost captures the generational trauma of living living with these memories deeply etched into my soul and brain. The Sabbath table, both a place of sanctuary and a place of trauma relived. By the time I was in third grade, I have vivid memories of being in the art room at Hyde School with Carl and making escape plans. As my hands were mixing temper paint to a vibrant green, I was realizing that if I pretended to be non-Jewish, I could escape if Hitler came back. I have blonde hair and blue eyes and no one would know. I could blend in. I never shared these plans or ideas with anyone and never talked about the fear that I constantly live with the fear that followed me everywhere. From the outside, I look fine and happy. As one of the only Jewish kids in my class at the time, I had to explain what things were, like matzahs or Rosh Hashanah. The duality existed again. I loved being Jewish, the holidays, the rituals, going to temple, learning Hebrew, but I was also scared of my love for my religion and culture because it could mean death. I lived in two worlds. I had mostly non-Jewish friends and boyfriends. I tried to pass, to fit in, to go to church with them, celebrate Christmas with them, go caroling and make ornaments in my Bluebirds group. But I also was active in my youth group and religious education. I would cry sometimes when I would go to temple services because my soul felt the deep connection to who I was, but the terror overshadowed the joy. I would watch the exits and plan my escape in every service. At the time, this was not normal. I never thought that this would become the norm as it has today with security guards at every temple and Jewish institution. Every fear that I had growing up is now a reality. Last week when my daughter entered Park Street Station and because she wears her Jewish star necklace outside her sweater and stands proudly in her heritage, she had someone yell an anti-Semitic slur at her. In my head, I think maybe she should hide it under her shirt to be safe. But then I think, how is that freedom? We should not have to hide who we are, none of us. We all should be proud of who we are always. And that is why I turn to making art and why I believe that art is essential in this dialogue. I believe in art for a change. Art that makes the viewer experience the world in a more humane way is the most powerful kind of art experience. I am always asking, how can I create a piece of art that transcends mere paint on canvas to become an image that makes a broader impact? My goals as an artist are to be able to be true to my own vision and path and to make work that helps the viewer see beyond themselves. I see my work as a nexus at the nexus of artist, educator, and researcher. I love making art and being in the studio by myself, creating, mixing paint, collaging, and juxtaposition, juxtaposing different textures and fragments of words to develop a body of work that when seen allows my work to be in dialogue with the viewer. But for me, painting and exhibiting my work has never been enough. My work as an artist is also about teaching people how to connect to their own creative self, and through the process, discover the power of their own mark and visual voice. Teaching and building community through the creative practice is my passion and purpose. I believe in the power of art to create community by first transforming the individual through the creative process, and then by bringing these individuals together in a creative way to build a collective And from this co-created community, the ripple of change can be transformative. On August 26, 2021, everything really shifted for me when a rabbi named Rabbi Shlomo Noginsky was stabbed in an anti-Semitic incident a block from my studio. 
He was stabbed eight times. The day after the stabbing, I went to a vigil in the park where it happened. In the teeming rain, a community of Jews and non-Jews came together. One of the Chabad rabbis spoke, and his words transformed me in the moment. He talked about the light driving out the darkness and how for every stab wound, we all should do eight good deeds to meet the darkness with the light of our actions. In that moment, I was struck by how he didn't delve into revenge or anger, but used the incident as a way to build hope. It was exactly what I needed to hear. The fear of the moment was paralyzing me, but his vision was to call to action and creativity. I then realized that we need a way to build bridges, to use art as a catalyst of conversation, and to create a project called Eight Good Deeds. One way that we all can stem the tide of racism and anti-Semitism is to practice deliberate acts of kindness. Every day, think of ways that you can build kindness acts into your day. These can be smaller acts like holding open a door or smiling at a stranger to larger acts of kindness like volunteering at a food pantry or bringing dinner to an elderly person. These deliberate acts of kindness have larger ripple effects in a community. You will see in your handout a list of suggestions of deliberate acts you can do. Share on social media using the hashtag 8GoodDeeds, and let's see how many deliberate acts we can all do together. Finally, in the piece Hineni, which translates to I am here, I pledge that I am here for you. This talk has taken me out of my comfort zone. I have never publicly spoken about any of this before, and I do feel exposed in showing my art and sharing my history. But knowing that my oldest friend is standing by my side as we both share stories is the essential act. Hineni is a visual reminder of how we can all be here for one another. We can all stand up for one another, listen to each other, even when it's difficult to. We can see one another as the beautiful and powerful individuals that we are, and we can walk with each other. We can commit to not being silent and be allies for one another when things get tough. The way we forge ahead is to commit to saying, I am here for each other, even if it's difficult. We can have the tough conversation. We can listen with open ears. We can reach out and hold each other's hands. We can commit to deliberate acts of kindness and can find ways to build in small good deeds every day. And hopefully, we can change the tide through the ripple effects of each of these actions. When we as Jewish and Black communities and individuals stand in solidarity with each other, then we can stem stem the tide of Jew hate and racism. I really appreciate everyone coming out tonight, and I hope this can be the start of an ongoing dialogue and that the art serves as a catalyst for continued conversation. First and foremost, uh, as Carl said earlier, thank you to everyone that came out here tonight. Uh, Thank you for Carl, of course, Deb, for your vision, your initiative uh, to put this show together around such an important issue. Thanks, Charles. The the forgotten alliance between African Americans and Jews. And as a Jewish American artist, not a Jewish American princess, but a Jewish American (laughs) artist, (laughs) Deb, you captured the spirit in your remarks and your artwork. So with that, I thought in these brief remarks, I'd just start with a a story about an African American artist, John Bigger. John Biggers, uh, some of his most famous works, Family One, uh, House of the Turtle, and he started the art department at Texas State University. And he also was fam- a famous muralist, as folks may know. Uh, he's got murals everywhere, of course, a great one at Texas State, 50 feet long. But John Biggers, when he went to Hampton uh, University, the historic black college, he, um, are you a graduate? There we go. All roads lead to Hampton. So, when he went there, he didn't want to be an artist. 
He went there to become a plumber. He, he had a vision to be a plumber. But he signed up for a drawing class one day with a guy named, the professor's name was Victor Lowenfeld. And Victor introduced John to the world of drawing, the, the world of art. And the crazy thing is that Victor came from Germany just after 1933 when Jews were no longer allowed to teach in academia. And he came here to America looking for work and of course uh, raging anti-Semitism as it was. I know Albert Einstein came here but all the colleges lined up for Albert Einstein but they weren't lining up for Victor Lowenfeld. But the historic black college and universities, they lined up for Victor Lowenfeld and 60 other academics coming from Nazi Germany who were oppressed and escaping oppression. So Victor came there, taught drawing. One of the things that was so important to him that he instilled in John Biggers was, do not forget your roots. So he made sure that all his students were introduced to Africa. And John never forgot that. And as I said, there were more than 60 of these professors with nowhere to go ended up at these uh, historic black colleges and universities. Another professor named Ernest Manassi, he taught at North Carolina Central University. And the most powerful thing he could teach is what he realized is we came from being oppressed and now we come here and unfortunately we feel like us Jews because we're white. We're part of the oppressors because here we are in the Jim Crow South. So one of the most powerful lessons he gave his students, him and other uh, professors that came to North Carolina Central where he was teaching, a few of the students were interviewed about their experience and one in particular said, these teachers from Nazi Germany cared for us. They demonstrated a recognition of the barriers we had to confront and committed themselves to arming us with what we needed to survive at home. So these oppressed people, oppressed people came, Jews, connected with the African Americans around their oppression in the Jim Crow South. So we're going to get back, as Deb said, these deliberate acts of kindness. The presidents of all of these historic black colleges and universities they showed a deliberate act of kindness by reaching out to people that had nowhere to go. And it's very similar, that, that story is very similar to another powerful alliance between blacks and Jews. And that was between a man, uh, Booker T. Washington, the great educator, and a man named Julius Rosenblum, who was a philanthropist, part of the Sears and Roebuck family. And Julius inspired Came, you know, met with Booker T. Washington, and he felt the number one thing to build equity in this country for blacks was education. So from 1910 to 1940, he helped build 5,000 schools called Rosenwald schools in the South. Rosenwald schools that educated young African Americans and provided African Americans professions by creating housing for teachers. So there again is another example of the powerful alliance between African Americans and Jews and how we both realized in each other's time of needs we would reach out. And you know the title of Deb's show, Forgotten Alliances, the alliance has been forgotten for whatever reason I talk about. Anger, bitterness, racism, anti-Semitism, partisanship in this country, in politics, we've forgotten the alliance. But the alliance isn't far away because at the heart of that alliance that the great presidents of these historic black colleges and universities showed, and what was the heart of the alliance of Julius Rosenwald and all the young African-American kids going to his schools, the heart of that alliance was a powerful human. One of the most powerful things us as humans have, and that's our compassion. So through that compassion and those deliberate, deliberate acts of kindness, the oppressed and the came together, reached out to one another, supported each other. And moving forward, that's the point of this show and Deb's vision. It's coming together through compassion, through these deliberate, these eight deliberate acts of kindness, right? Why, how, 
often an act of kindness be random? The more powerful it is, if it's deliberate, it's a lot more powerful, exactly as you see in these examples. So moving forward, we'll continue to use these deliberate acts of kindness, rebuild the alliance, not just between blacks and Jews, but everybody. So thank you all for being here, and thank you. I stand here before you at multiple intersections. One of these intersections is my race. I can't wash off the color of my skin no more than you can stop wearing the things that make you who you are and show the world that you are a proud Jewish woman. And I would never ask you not to do that. The other intersection I stand at is as a woman of Latinx heritage. And the final, and perhaps one of the most important intersections I stand at, holds my identity, my spiritual identity, as a Jewish woman of color. And I want to be clear to you that I can't be one of these things without the other. They are who I am. And it's funny because as I was thinking about what I should say tonight, when I was writing up these words, I remembered something very strange to some of you perhaps. I chose to be a Jew. I chose to be an active part of a community with traditions going back thousands of years. I chose to be a part of a tradition that was founded on a covenant that asks us to do whatever we can to show love, not just to a cosmic entity known as God, but to our community and to the world. This seems like an easy set of rules, right? But what do you do when the world you love hates everything you are on multiple levels? How do you show love when there are many around us at this very moment actively conspiring to tear down and destroy everything I love? How? When you break the glass panes on a memorial standing across the street from us at the corner of Union Street, you break the continuity of six million souls. You break the chain of numbers engraved there, each of those numbers representing a mother, a father, a daughter, a son, human lives that were lost to the horrors of hate in one of the most egregious systematic genocides since the North Atlantic slave trade. When I enter my synagogue for Friday night services or on high holidays, or to fulfill any one of the duties that I have taken on as a part of the Temple Israel community, a community that Deb, her daughter, Rabbi Zecher, and many of us sitting here tonight love, I notice several things. I become hyper aware of my surroundings. I recognize that there's security personnel at the entrance. I recognize that there's a police cruiser sometimes parked on Metal Way facing the entrance to the synagogue. And I make it my business to remember where the exits are. I look around to see who I am seated closest to. Do they have a child? Are they elderly? Are they a member of the clergy? And then I ask myself a series of questions. How fast can I get to them if the unthinkable happens? How fast can I run while pulling a mother with her young child? Will I be too afraid to act? Will I be able to call for help? I do this because the thought of losing anyone in that synagogue tears at the very fabric of my being. And let me be clear to you, it is the same feeling that I feel when I hear the name Sandra Bland, a Tatiana Jefferson, Breonna Taylor, and now Tyree Nichols. In a 2021 lecture hosted by the Yale University Program for the Study of Anti-Semitism, Activist and scholar Eric Greer names racism 
and its real-time partner, anti-Semitism, as social movement phenomenons that are at the core of the white nationalist agenda. And they are not alone. Classism, sexism, and most importantly, xenophobia are active players in that moment, in that movement as well. These isms and phobia serve no purpose but to divide us and to promote fear and disdain. Fear of my color and disdain for our spiritual identity. We are all in this together. And I will repeat this again, we are all in this together. There is no me, there is no you, and there is no them. There is only us. The Jewish community and communities of color united together, fighting the same fight and feeling the same pain. White nationalists don't care that the color of our skin has less pigment than someone else's. They don't care that Tree of Life is a synagogue or that Emmanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church is a church. Destroying us is their mission. Why? Because they know that when we are united, when we are together, we are powerful. Our communities united make change. Now I want to talk about something. Because as a woman of color, I told you intersections, right? So there's a guy named Kanye West out there. Kanye does not speak for me. And I want to make this very clear. He does not speak to me because I do not owe a madman responsible for genocide my forgiveness. Who is he to tell me that I do? And who is, me to t who is he to tell so many of you who lost people during that time that you should apologize? that you should forgive. Seven digits to replace a name. Seven digits that were etched into skin just as brands were burned into the skin of my ancestors who looked like me from places with traditions I will never know because of the transatlantic slave trade. To Kyrie Irving I say something similar. The earth isn't flat. It is round, and anti-Semitism is not an abstract concept you muse about in the hate-filled echo chambers of Twitter. Anti-Semitism is real, and you have, as an athlete and as a man of color, the very real responsibility to not fuel the fires of hate. Because again, I say you are a black man living in a world where your privilege as a millionaire baller only goes as far as game time. White supremacists don't care that you can shoot a three-pointer. Racism doesn't care that you can dribble a ball. And xenophobia certainly doesn't care that you live in a nice part of town or that you drive an expensive car. And if you don't believe me, ask Eric Garner and George Floyd. Somewhere along the way, as many of us noted tonight, we forgot collectively about the pogroms involving global Jewish communities in Eastern Europe. We forgot that they were mirror images years later of Tulsa and Greenwood. We forgot that Andrew Goodman, James Earl Cheney, and Michael Henry Schirmer shared the same shallow grave in a ditch in Mississippi. We forgot that Abraham Heschel prayed with his feet as he walked arms linked with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. across the Edmund Pettus Bridge. And we forgot that Rabbi Joaquin Prince viewed racism and anti-Semitism as two sides of the same coin. Somewhere along the line, we forgot that change does not happen in silence. We don't get to where we're going by working together. Dr. King knew this. It is why he reached across the aisle at every chance he got 
and Abraham Heschel, and he were the best of friends. We forgot that racism happens in real time, on the red line, where someone can shout at someone from my faith community and call her something terrible. We forgot that at the same time, someone can kill a man or a woman with my skin color simply because they are going somewhere. We forgot that these things happen in real time. And to combat them, we have to work together in real time. We have to look beyond just eight good deeds and recognize that these eight good deeds should be the start of something that we do and embody every day. We must pledge to never forget that hate is spawned in real time. But the one thing that we should always remember is that together, regardless of skin color, regardless of affiliation, regardless of how you show up in the world as a Jew, we are united. I stand here as a living proof to that, as a bridge between multiple identities, and as a bridge that wants to be walked on, that wants to connect. And I thank you, Dad, for your art, for your 